I will run this way. Oh, you're fine. <laughs> we'll get coordinated somehow. Um, first, before I get into the introductions, I want to wish all of you on behalf of the Open Historical Society and my family a happy Thanksgiving. Um, we're so glad that you're here today. And I think this is going to be a very heartwarming presentation because, as you all know, we're losing a lot of our World War II veterans. And some of these wonderful stories were not saved or recorded. And Ken has done an excellent job, I love his book, of telling these stories for future generations so that we can all understand what went into the efforts for World War II. Um, and that really is all I want to say about your book. I do want to tell, let you know that while this is the final one, the final lecture in the fall series, we will be starting in the spring um, with three presentations. The first one is a very interesting one. If you have been aware of some of the other topics, we've talked about polonium in the playhouse and the contribution to the bomb and the trigger mechanism and everything. Well, there's a wonderful connection between all of that work that was done and some of the spacecraft that are now being sent into orbit, into to Mars and explore, they carry with it technology that was developed here in Oakwood. So we're gonna explore that connection between Polonium and the Playhouse and this now next generation of space exploration. Uh, then we're going to have some, our speaker just walked in, for the next, the, <laughs> in, in March, Mark is, Mark is going to be talking about the, the 1913 flood, but from an Oakwood perspective. You know, we've all heard all about what went on downtown and everything else, but this is going to be the perspective of how did Oakwood up here on the hill help in the flood effort to make sure that people. And then finally, we're really excited we're going to have uh, a representative from Allwood Audubon Center and come and talk about Marielle, the wonderful woman who started that whole group out there and why she felt it was so important to, to conserve nature. And we're gonna tie it into the library's garden program and that always also going to talk about native plants, how to sustain them and planting so that you can increase songbirds, the kind of plants and the songbirds. And so that'll be in April. So it's a good season coming up as well. So without further ado, I can talk about your credentials and. The fact that you're from Tip City and everything else, but I think people just want to hear you talk and tell stories. So, Thank Ken. You, Donna. Is this one? Can you hear me? Yeah, They messed with my audio. I apologize, everyone. It's okay. <laughs> Is it on? Here? Is it on? No. Yeah, I think that's the button. Not sure. It could be earlier. Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> on one of these Sundays, on a far hill, it's all going to go right. Well, then, I swear. <laughs> Okay. Okay, it's on now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Thank you for coming here today, folks. Uh, I guess I want to start how I met these people. Actually, it was, uh, thank you, it was 25 years ago on the 11th of this month. I had an appointment up in uh, St. Mary's, Ohio. It was late in the morning. I arrived there, and the man I was going to see, and the reason I was going to see this man was because mm -hmm. I worked with people who had low vision. With low vision, macular degeneration typically affects you as you age, and I had a contract with all the VAs in Ohio, and I, my brother and I had this business where we had these video magnifiers that could enlarge the print. They were able to read, write, and again, resume normalcy of life. So I had an appointment with this man. I arrived on time, but he was out in his driveway. He was saluting his flag, and I just waited until he was done. When he was done, he looked at me, and I could tell he had been crying. Oh, dear. We finished our appointment, and he explained why he was out there. He said he was a lieutenant on Fort Chop Hill 522 was his, his hill. And I had known about Port Chop Hill, not as well as I do now, 
but he, uh, Court Chop Hill was in 1953. It was a horrible battle in Korea. And I wanted to double check and find out a little bit more information. So I went home and I looked it up. On Hill 522, this man I had just met an hour earlier, he had 61 men under his command. 25 survived. And then I, it hit me, my gosh, this is the 11th day of the 11th hour of the 11th month. I totally forgot this was Veterans Day. And so from that point on, I wanted to collect their stories. I wanted to get primarily World War II stories because I knew there were going to be less time on this earth for these men. So that's why I started getting it. I met a lot of people, a lot of World War II, and primarily that's what this book is about. So I wrote it when I retired. I will point out my father, he doodled that when he was 17 years old, when he was in the service, when he was in the Army Air Force. And um, he doodled that. I used the just, I wanted primarily state of Ohio because that's really who I spoke to. Yeah, now, World War II, when it started, we always think December 7th, 1941. But if you were in Ethiopia, it started in 1935. That's when Mussolini, who had already been in power since the 20s, it's during the middle of the Depression, he went over to Ethiopia. He wanted to put a lot of his unemployed Italians over there to get them out of Italy, and he wanted the minerals of Ethiopia. In 37 is when Japan packed China. They wanted their minerals, and they were so brutal to the Chinese. Yeah. I go into more detail in the book. We, uh, we were in the 41, but if you were in Poland, it would have happened in 1939, where Germany attacked them. 16 weeks later, you had Russia attacking them from the other side, the east and west. They were getting squeezed. So we have some people that were over there at this time. This young lady, at the time, she was a young lady. She was 16 years old. She was living in Rome. She was actually captured by the SS and thrown into prison along with her sister, Juliana. This is one of the two people that's from my book that I wrote about that are still alive. She lives at St. Leonard's right now, and she's uh, in a nursing area. Her name is Katerina Fortini, a real sweet woman. This is another man. I, I knew him 45 years before I got his story down. His name is Dolph Bierman. He was in Holland, and you'll hear about or inside the book the three separate times he escaped from the Germans. He eventually made it over here, and he was, he was a chemist at University of Dayton, but uh, he escaped from Holland, from the jail in Paris. He uh, imitated, not imitated, he learned another language of a man who actually died in the jail because they had all sorts of undesirables, gypsies, Jewish, non-French people in there. So he learned another language. That man died. He interpreted, or he, he improvised. He played like he was that man who just died. So he was able to get out. He got on the train, him and his friend Francois Dubassay, he worked his way down to the southern end of France in a train. The SS, they were coming down the Gestapo. Him and his friend Francois, they climbed on the outside of the train, pried open the nails, and he was hanging on like Spider-Man. Mm -hmm. Eventually, he jumped, it up, jumped off, and he followed the Pyrenees Mountains over to Portugal. But he followed them, but never on the trail, because on the trail, you'd get caught. He made it over to uh, Cincinnati, worked his way up, and he uh, lived a long life here in the area. Now, there's some other people, too. Uh, these individuals, uh, under Operation Pied Piper, these kids were put on the train. And there's one that made it over here, Page Manor, actually, but put on the train and were sent out into the country. Liverpool and London were getting bombed continuously by the Luftwaffe. So they made it out to the country. So the train would stop and the older people, because the young ones are all in, all in the service, they would stop and I'll take that girl, but I don't want that guy, her brother. So from seven until 12, she never saw her brother or her family. 
she lived in an old couple's house in an alcove right by the uh, kitchen. She had three ounces of meat a week, and it was kind of trying for a young kid to do that. Now, this looks out of place, but we had some that made it here. Some that made it here. In fact, Otto Spaeth, who lived on Running Meat Road over here, he was a wealthy man. His, he said, I made my first million off this. Now, he was a veteran also. The day he was commissioned is the day that World War I ended. So he decided, I got to get a job. He's no longer an officer. He went to, uh, his father had a brewery in Decatur, Illinois, Decatur Blue Ribbon. So Otto decided he's going to use what his dad's been using, which was maple syrup. You couldn't get sugar back then. It was such a high demand. So he went around to different breweries and sold them on the idea of sweetening your beer with maple syrup versus sugar. So they sold the idea to Pabst and they merged Pabst Blue Ribbon. But it's kind of interesting to have a big beer like that, which was the number one beer in World War I, has its origin really from this neighborhood, running me right across 48. Uh -huh. Now, so he took kids in. Operation Piper brought kids here. Now, total six made it to Oakwood. The English and American uh, upper ups, they wanted it, the kids to go to the religion that the kids were from. So the kid on the left is a guy named Tony Bailey, and the one on the right is Tony Spade, Otto's son, Otto and Eloise's son. So they just called him Tony S. and Tony B, but he made it here. And it's kind of fun or interesting that those boys did the same thing that maybe some of us did when we were much younger. I was reading this book about Tony Spade, Tony Bailey, and he said they used to call up a tobacco shop and said, do you have Prince Philip, Prince Philip in a can? Someone knew what I was talking about. And you better, you better let him out. He needs some air. I think we probably all heard that and did that. First time uh, Tony Bailey ever saw a black man was when he came over here. He thought he was an Indian, a dark guy. He was a he was the Tony, the space of chauffeur and a butler, but uh, it surprised him. But he lived a good life here. He learned this American football. These were the other five kids that one, two, three, four, five, including Tony, that lived here in Oakwood. That the Oakwood opened their arms and we, um, they accepted them. And there was a Jewish girl. Now, Tony was a Catholic, so they brought, brought him with this face where there's a Jewish girl that they put with the Jewish family, the uh, Rosenblums, I think, over on Grand Avenue. So they tried to hook them up with the right families. Now, Otto also did, he tried to take inventions and make them better. He made better suspenders than was on the market. And he did some other things, but he took a Greyhound bus and made it like into the first Winnebago. <laughs> he had two uh, different staging areas, sleeping areas. Now, the reason he did that, all of his friends, he was a wealthy man, but his friends all had a boats and he couldn't swim. He didn't want to learn to swim. So he traveled with his uh, his improvised Winnebago and traveled around. He had a couple nicknames for it. There's Truman obviously in one of them. They called it the automobile <laughs> or the space ship. <laughs> so we uh, in 1940, a year before we had a uh, Pearl Harbor, Things were tough around here. It's still the depression. The average median income was nine hundred and forty-six dollars a year. Well, that's for a family, thirty cents an hour. So it was tough. I last year I had the pleasure of having lunch with these uh, one, two, three, five different uh, World War II guys down in Mason, Ohio. But uh, that's probably the last time you can get that many guys together. But it was a nice lunch, and I had to get their picture. That's Adolf. He made his way to Annapolis, by the way, and he became a Marine. So um, I'm going to skip over the people that aren't from here, but he was the first man who saw the Japanese come in. 
This is the first boy that saw him. He's still with us. He's 95 now, but he was living on top of the hill over all the ships that were docked in at, at Pearl Harbor. And he used to go down there every, every Friday because the sailors would come in on Thursday and uh, they'd want to go into Honolulu on Friday night so they'd get their shoe shines. He'd make a nickel for every time he did a shoe or two shoes, a pair. And he would, uh, one time he told me like that, I got to die. So he was thrilled with that. <laughs> His name was Walter Oka. All eight boys were in the service. They were Nietzsche's. Jap born second generation Japanese Americans, and they were the most decorated army group in the United States Army. All those boys. This is the youngest one that ever made it in, 12 years old. His name is Calvin Graham. Again, he's not from Ohio, but we were having these kids from, well, they hadn't really should have been 18, but over in Indiana, some of the recruiters, they wanted to meet their quota. They would have a young guy stand on this. Are you over 18? Yes, sir, I am. Come on in. And another fella, he was he was uh, swearing in with 200, pe 200 other people inside the uh, a hall. I'll raise our hand to take the oath. And uh, when it was over with, one guy said, sir, sir, I had my left hand up, so I guess I'm not in. The guy behind you had both hands up. Welcome aboard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nadine Nagel, she's a sweet lady. She was a pilot. Now, her husband was a pilot, and on his way back from bombing a submarine uh, port in France, a German submarine port, they crashed in Wales. And uh, she lost her husband. Now she had just gotten married. She had just graduated from um, Kansas Teaching College. So here she was a young teacher, a young lady, and she was a widow. So her, along with 25,000 other women, they wanted to become pilots. They wanted to become wasps. And she became one. Only 900 made it. She lived in Kettering. She lived in River, Riverside. And she passed away in 17 over in Centerville. A sweet woman, young lady. That's the last time I saw her. And that's again a picture of Nadine. This guy was 15 when he joined. His father was a professional fighter. He wanted to be a Marine. My dad's a tough guy. I'm going to be a tough guy. And he joined to be a Marine. That's his father on the left. Another woman up in West Milton, Ohio, she uh, she wanted to become a mechanic because she knew mechanics. She always took her father to go to work down in Inglewood, and she she knew mechanics in and out. She wanted to join. They said, nope, you're a woman. Can't do it. Eventually, they conceded and allowed her in. That happened a lot. They had a, a thinking back then. Even with teachers, I found out teachers, they did not want teachers, grade school teachers, to be married because they should devote their time to the kids. That was a little strange back then. There's another wasp pilot. She learned to drink and she learned to play cards and <laughs> she was a wasp. Now this mail call, this is, uh, you probably remember Milton Kniff, or some of you do, did Steve Canyon. I found one of these books in Toledo. It's full of his comics. So when the, world, the, war, the war started, pardon me, he wanted to be, join up, but he was physically unable. So he already had a comic strip that was syndicated out in New York called Terry and the Pilots. They wouldn't let him use it. So he came up with another one. There was a sexy, attractive woman in Terry and the Pilots, but he made it a little bit more attractive, He, the woman, and she was tawdry, she was suggestive, but she never did anything. It was geared to the GIs. She always got the GIs, never the brass, never the generals. So they, they kind of liked that. And they, the men looked forward it was to these comic strips. It was in over 3,000 papers, military papers. They looked forward to it sometimes more than they did their letters from home. But you're welcome to take a look at these if you'd like. This 
Let's see what I have next on here. I have to show this. Mrs. Black's her name. Her three boys are all from the area. And um, this is the only picture they have of Mrs. Black, their mother. But the three boys, Calvin Coolidge Black, Warren G. Black, and Woodrow Wilson Black. <laughs> <laughs> she liked presidents, dead presidents, so she named them all that. A woman from Centerville, she's here with uh, Jimmy Doolittle and the Queen. I want to get her in there. Uh, Richard Yount, he was, he joined in 1939. He saw the writing in, on the wall. His father was in World War I, so uh, he joined up. He was down in Dayton, um, and he was in this cavalry group. And his, you know, we all heard OHIO for the Ohio Buckeyes. In fact, I heard it yesterday. Well, he's the original. His guys, they had OHIO. They were going to federalize his National Guard unit, so they came, came up with OHIO, which stood for Over the Hill in October. They didn't want to federalize. <laughs> so whenever I hear the OH, however it goes, I think of Richard Yao. But he turned into he turned into a Eisenhower's go-to guy with anything electronics. In fact, when I first met him, I met him two minutes ago. His wife and him, they were sitting on the couch right in front of me. He's 96 years old at the time. He lived to 101. 96 years old, and he said, hey, Ken, did I ever tell you about the time I was in bed with Mrs. Douglas MacArthur? <laughs> I'm thinking, but you don't want to do this. Your wife's right there. And uh, she rolls her eyes. She's heard this story a thousand times. And he's, he starts snorting because he knows it's funny for him. It's funny, really. Eisenhower had her go over to General MacArthur's place where he was living because her radio wasn't working and she was uh, sick. So he sat on the bed and fixed the radio. But he had to story <laughs> the rest of his life. Exactly. And she, uh, Marilyn is her name. She uh, worked at the Heidelberg uh, Hospital, and that's where they took General Patton when he had his accident. That's my father. I'll put his story in. I got to keep moving. Uh, he lives in the Dayton, lived in the Dayton area, but he went to a baseball game at Cincinnati Ridge Crossley Field on June 11th, 1936. There was 5,900 people in the audience or in the stands. The next time he went to this to Cincinnati, he was going to uh, basic training. <laughs> they were averaging 34,000 people a day, primarily all just young soldiers going to their destination. But if you happen to go to a ball game next year down at Great American Ballpark, you're going to see a plaque on the wall recognizing the day my father was at that game. Back, also, Johnny Vandermeer, he pitched the first of two back-to-back no-hitters. We claim it's my dad, that's why it's there. <laughs> there you have, um, these guys are all from Indiana, but the, the number one family here of boys going into the war was the uh, Eldridge family. And they were, uh, they lived on Cincinnati Street, that's pretty close to where St. Elizabeth used to be. They lived there, they all went in. One went to Australia, one went to Austria, New Guinea, France, Ireland, and California. But that was the most they had from Montgomery County. The most they had from Miami County was seven brothers. Marion Adams was his name. This happens to be Don Walters and Pee Wee Martin. You might be familiar with Pee Wee Martin. He passed away a year ago on 9-11, but he has, he's in eight chapters, Pee Wee. He's on the right to recognize at, at Bellbrook here at a football game. Where Don Walters, he went to Parker Co-op. Now, I asked him, why, why did you join? And I hope it's the next one. It is. He joined because this man was his teacher back in grade school. He was 14 when Pearl Harbor started, and his teacher then was Steve Thompson. Steve Thompson was the first man to bring a German pilot down, and he was Germany's ace. If you go out to the library, they have a display piece on him. He had to dig out a bullet out of his ankle when he landed, 
but um, he was later a geometry teacher at Parker Co-op. This is Ray Dean, the harmonica machine. That's what he it looks like a farm, some sort of farm tool. But uh, Ray Dean, he was born, he made his, he lived in Dayton, but he was born in West Virginia. He was a heck of a character, ominous. I can tell you, but you can read about it if you're in, interested. I got to speed this up. I talked to Scoop earlier, I believe, about this. I love going to small town parades, and this is in Pleasant Hill, Ohio. These are back in 2012. Six high school kids that were um, uh, replicating the Iwo Jima flag, the flag on there. Just love those small towns. This is a man from Dayton. His name is Johnny McLeod. He uh, worked at the Kroger's on Cincinnati Avenue. He came up from Tennessee. He got a job there. But Johnny McLeod was a medic, and he was the first man to hit Omaha Beach. Good guy. He passed away in, right before Christmas in 01 at 102 years old. He was with my two grandkids at the time there. I wanted to capture that because that would be like a picture of me with a, a Civil War veteran, the same age difference. Sure. I'm going to keep going if you don't mind. This this boy, this man, when he was born, 15 pounds, Beauty, Kentucky. This is the area with the hut where the Hatfields and McCoys clashed, right over there down in uh, Kentucky. Big guy. When he was 15, he was working on the uh, railroad lines up by um, Lake Erie. They said he's the strongest man they ever knew. Big guy, not fat, just big and strong. <laughs> and uh, he was, um, later on, he was in uh, coal mines, and he also went down to, uh, on the barges, down to Louisiana. Glenn Mader, he has interesting stories. I'm going to sneak it in, what the heck. <laughs> he's, in, he's in Korea, and every night he did the same thing. He took a, a truck up to the 38th parallel, and he picked up dead bodies. And he had to bring them back. He kept his lights out. He's driving all the way back. <laughs> On a weaving road, he knew it inside out. He lit up a palm oil. I find out, found out what cigarette he smoked in his palm oils. He lit it up with the lighter to it, took a drag, very intoxicating for a smoker. And all of a sudden, an arm came over his shoulder. He got, he got a light GI? He's all over the road. <laughs> but, um, Interesting man. I enjoyed him. He's a great woodworker. Um, well, it's in there. Him and his wife. He traveled all over the United States. It's incredible woodworking. But I got a call a week ago Saturday from Merlin, his wife. She told me that he just passed away. And that's I get these calls quite often in the past. It's slowing down now because <clears throat> obvious reasons. This, I didn't know was there. This for his 25th wedding anniversary. That's Merlene without the hair. And she's blowing a kiss to him. He did the same one on the opposite side. Very nice gift. He did the woodworking. His face, her face. Nice gift. I couldn't pull that off. Is dinner okay with you, honey? All right. This is how he got around. And I love that. A walker with a big old guy. You don't want to mess with him. This is Pee Wee. Like I said, he was in eight chapters. Incredible story. He did not even want to join up. 87% of Americans did not want to join up. They still had the World War I stigma to it. We don't need to do that. Uh, but he joined up. He went down because at work, he was at a tool shop. All the guys, there's too many empty rooms there, empty places. They were taking men up to 35 years old with kids. And so uh, he decided to join up. He loved reading Jules Verne books. So he wanted to be the Navy, but he saw a poster on the wall stating that uh, this new thing that Omar Bradley's starting, these parachutes, paid $100 a month versus the Navy at $50 a month. So he, <laughs> smart guy, I guess you could say, and he became 101st Airborne and original. So you follow him, this man, he, he leaves on June 5th, the day before D-Day, he parachutes 101st Airborne into St. Mary Glees, which is behind the lines where the Germans are. And a great story that he tells there. Next time out, he's in Market Garden, which was kind of a flop for the uh, Allies. But he goes into detail. I had another guy at Market Garden, Market Garden down from Springboro. 
uh, George Burkoff. He, um, his plane was on fire. They got shot, shot by the German anti, by the guns, and uh, his plane was jumping out. He jumped out. He landed on the way down. He got shot in the shoulder, so he's in big pain. And then on the ground, he got shot in the hand. He was in, he was in the uh, style of different style of. He made a trade. So this is a terrible picture. He made a trade with the German. He got a Red Cross package that had cigarettes in it, and he had some cigarettes. A German guard wanted some of those cigarettes, so he traded the cigarettes for some long johns. It's mighty cold this time of year. He got the long johns. If you can make it out, he made an American flag out of it. So later on, when the Russians were coming in '45, May of '45, they were they were rushing to take care of all the Germans. The Germans had him walking, going westward for weeks at a time, and he had his long johns made an American flag, so he was able to show it to the American planes going overhead that, okay, these aren't Germans, leave them alone, there's Americans, a big long line of American POWs. But you're going to also follow him, numerous stories in Battle of the Bulge, uh, very interesting, including when they got the Eagle's Nest, that was uh, Hitler's out, or his hideout in Austria, and uh, the things they took, and, I mean, not him individually, but the Americans were able to take today. Uh, they had 100,000 bottles of liquor. Uh, that's amazing. But he took uh, quite a few guns and shipped them home. And then I have another fellow who was there, called him Boots Guy. His real name was Claire. Uh, the last time I saw him, he was at the nursing home, and I said, Boots, did you have any other nicknames? Let me think for a minute. He says, well, I'm still mad at my mother for naming me Claire. <laughs> <laughs> but he said he did have another nickname. During mail call, they, his last name was Guy, G-E-U-Y. They would call his name out. We got mail for Guy. And he would come up, but there was a guy person from Louisiana, G-A-E-Y, pronounced Guy. So they would butt heads. So the next time the, uh, the mailman came by and gave him a different kind of name. He's, he pronounced it phonetically. All right, I got mail for a gooey guy. A gooey guy. So Claire Boots, with that, you'd go get it. And looking at, is there a gay guy in the house? <laughs> <laughs> oh my, this yeah. is, I'm a skip him. He's Cincinnati. Skip him. Uh, this is a Dick Cole. Now, Dick is from a Steel High School at the time, Dayton. He was the co pilot. Uh, to Jimmy Doolittle. They were friends, these two, Dick. Uh, J. Pee Wee Martin, he was called Pee Wee, weighed 106 pounds, smallest guy. If you've read, read Band of Brothers, you get an idea what he went through. And Dick Cole, in addition to uh, Doolittle's um, co pilot, he also did a lot of runs to China to uh, give, to help the Chinese during over the hump. They take things to China because Japan just kept attacking them. Um, I'll skip that. A man has a collection of BSA bikes. Um, that man was 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Okay. He, <laughs> he was involved in Operation Mincemeat, which is an interesting story. Uh, that guy who did Operation Mincemeat, he also wrote Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. He also did all the gold James Bond movies. But uh, it was really, the Operation Mincemeat was very interesting to fool the Germans, and we did it. I uh, used that guy and that guy. He was, this is a man they used to portray the other man who was a um, General William Martin, who had all these things in his pocket uh, letters to his fiance, receipts for a diamond ring he was going to give to her. It's all bogus because there was no fiance. But he also had instructions that after we took Operation Torch, which is Africa, we were going to go to Crete, we were going to go to Sardinia. It was bogus, but Hitler bid on it. He sent divisions to Crete and, and Sardinia. We were able to go through Sicily pretty easily because two divisions were gone. Uh, we have POW camps here in Ohio, if you're aware of it. 
there was 800 that were right over here, uh, right field. And then um, they had them in Wilmington, 13 altogether. And we had them up at, uh, this one is up at uh, Salina, Ohio, right on the lake. They use it as uh, work on boats now. John Wonder, he lived real close to here by the green. And he was the pilot, the B-24 pilot, uh, flew out of Libya into Europe. Good man. Glen Burley Mount Casino, if you're not familiar with that, this was a 1,700-foot mountain where um, it was built in the, because Mount Casino was a monastery that was built in the 1500s uh, by St. Benedict. And uh, we, we kept trying and trying to take it, but 1,700 feet up is a rather difficult thing to do. We finally brought the bombs in, the bombers in, attacked it, we took it over. Now, why this was important, it was a, called the Gustav Line, a mountain range about 60 miles south of, of uh, Rome, and it's preventing Americans getting up there. They were to hold that at all costs, the Germans were. So we finally took it, a bomb landed one foot away from the, the tomb of uh, St. Benedict, never went off, mm -hmm. a dud. And it, that was, and still is, a patron saint of Europe. There's Pee Wee again, uh, Marion Adams. Now, he had seven, altogether seven brothers. They had a farm up off 48. And he um, and all his brothers, three sisters and parents ran the farm, 36 acres. They all went into the service, but 36 acres, if it was a good year, they'd split the profits with the man who owned the uh, land. But um, his interesting stories, he was all over. He was at Gold Sword, Juno, Omaha, and Utah Beach. He was at Operation Dragoon. He was over in, in uh, Okinawa. Interesting stories, all of them. But the one that's most interesting is Slapped in Sands. Are you familiar with that? It happened in April of um, 44. It was a dry run, actually, for to make sure we can get our LSTs, just work the cakes out, and before we actually had D-Day in June of that year. So everything went belly up, basically. Uh, a couple of E-boats, German E-boats got in. We were attacking England, just a mock-up, and um, this, like I said, to see if things would work out. E-boats, one E-boat got in and hit an LST, and um, caused a lot of damage. We lost four times the amount of men then than we had on uh, Omaha Beach, Utah Beach, excuse me. So it was kept quiet until 1984 is when it was made known to the public on a 60 Minutes episode on a Sunday night. I saw, I remember seeing that episode. I was floored by it. And uh, he was with his niece at the time. He ran upstairs and got his, Log, log book, he says, that's what I remember what they're saying on TV, where what they were told, seven men died, the 946 did. How did they die? Well, a lot of them died, it's really gruesome. They jumped into the water and they had their life preservers on upside down. So when they jumped in the water, it flipped them over like this in the water. It was very self induced, actually. The, uh, the admiral of that ship of the whole organization. He committed suicide, he couldn't take it. This is another local guy. He was, uh, he ran the hospital on the White Cliffs of Dover. It's the biggest hospital they had where Marion would take uh, many of the wounded, all together Americans, English, and even Germans to get the taken care of. Uh, they, the Marion actually lived within five miles of him. They really never met until they, they kind of went in war because he'd have to take the men over to a uh, hospital. And he ended up being a lieutenant governor of Ohio. His name is Roy Weicker. And in addition, he had he had a belief that whatever is conceivable is achievable. And um, at 80 years old, he was bungee jumping in New Zealand. In 90 years, he was driving alone from California back to Ohio. He walked every day to, if you had to go to the doctors, he'd just walk to it, never never drive. One of the day in shape, I'll skip old Clyde. Oh, heck, I got to tell you. Clyde, 
he was a special guy. He was a raider and a scout. And um, he told me they only wanted boys from West Virginia and Florida, or excuse me, West Virginia and Kentucky. I said, why is that? We're the only ones who could hold our breath underwater for four minutes. <laughs> when I got ready to leave, he said, are you a hay foot or a straw foot? I said, Mr. Conley, I'm, I'm going to have to check on that. I really don't know. Well, Hayfoot sig signifies to boys from West Virginia and Kentucky, Hayfoot, Strawfoot, Hayfoot, Strawfoot. That's how they marched. They didn't know right or left. Uh, Katerina. Now, Katerina, she, um, after the war, um, Dwight Eisenhower came down and he was going to give a commendation to a guy named Richard Hedrick. Now, this is Richard Hedrick as a very young boy. Interesting background. He was uh, in movies with Shirley Temple with that curly hair. He was a great violinist. He was swimming at six months. He was a child evangelist. He was friends with Wilbur Wright, the one who lived the longest. I always get that mixed up. Orville. 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 Thank you, Orville. I still get it mixed up. <laughs> friends with Orville Wright. But um, they married. He said, that's the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. I'm going to marry that woman. They did get married, and then they got divorced. Pictured Johnny McLeod again. Uh, my my father was, uh, just to let you know, he was a bombardier. That's why I'm wearing this get-up. This is a hat he wore on D-Day. I'll take it off now. Um, I have a long story there that appeared September 28, 1944, in the uh, Journal Herald. They had a Sunday edition then. And um, he describes what it was like when they took off from England and they parachuted. Uh, my father describes his way. He was. Um, he always told me that the uh, cooks were so nervous that morning. They took off on D-Day, so, so nervous. They made for the breakfast entree bread soaked in pineapples. And he'd go back to saying how nervous they were. But in reality, they had 11,590 planes take off that day. They all got the same thing, but the pineapple juice kind of relieves anxiety. So it wasn't the cooks that were nervous. It was to make sure the pilots and their crew, they were fine. Johnny, that's uh, Johnny McLeod, Regime, another guy. Now this guy, name is, what's his name? Roy, that's my dad. Hmm? That's my dad. Right. <laughs> this guy is Roy's favorite, is his name. He's from the Belmont area. And um, here he is getting a commendation. He had Silver Star. But on D Day, he never mentioned anything to his son. You don't mind me doing that now. Yeah. Dick, his stick figure, this, this man's son. But he, so many men did not want to talk about their their time and service. They saw a lot of gruesome things. But he did tell his grandson some interesting things, like all the helmets, all the men had helmets with numbers on them. One, two, three, four. You were not allowed to switch helmets. You had to keep your helmet and never switch. The reason one might indicate medic, two might indicate something else. And so you could not switch. Now, he... Uh, Dick has a, a plaque at home. I have uh, let me see that. Pardon me? I have it here. Oh, you have it here. Yeah. Oh, good. Thank you. Yes. This is a plaque. I'm not going to read it, but it gives some clues on what Roy did in the service. And we were able to figure out, figure out what he did. Operation Cobra, which was 220 miles up from Normandy. Initially, it was supposed to be on the same day as uh, Normandy, the D-Day invasion, but we didn't have enough people, LSTs, armament, etc. So they delayed it. Omar Bradley in July, yeah, July, seven weeks after D-Day, they implemented here, and and Roy was in that and had a silver star. He saved numerous lives. I think it was 17, 17 lives because he went from man to man. Uh, helping them, and, uh, he remembers uh, so many Germans killing people as every regular citizens. He remembers a lot of that, and then he goes to another area where the Americans had actually been, and he sees stacks of cigarettes 
and stacks of candy for the state, for the uh, the locals. But it was fun to reestablish what your father did. A lot of fun. Listen, you didn't know. I, This guy's a spy for us. He was recruited 16 years old by Bill Donovan, while Bill Donovan, the head of the OSS, later on and became two minutes. Later on, he became um, a spy for us after learning a totally different subject in at Hughes High School in Cincinnati. He had to learn French. Uh, language, French terrain. Well, the man went behind the lines, third wave of D-Day, went behind the lines, not with the, not with the gun, but with a uh, bicycle. So he pedaled back there. He got a job in taverns. He would sing songs to the guys. He knew German because his family was German. He used to sing on WKRC in Cincinnati during German hour. But he would sing songs about my dear Lucretia back at home or, and that bring tears to the German soldiers who were in there. And all the while, he'd be filling up their glasses of wine or beer and they'd get a little loose tongue and he'd hear all these things. He'd run back to Patton and, and Montgomery and tell them what he heard. So good setup. He was playing the angle of a, a Swiss student uh, touring Europe. It worked. Uh, this is a spy too. She's from Ohio. Her real name is Mildred Gillers. She's from Conneaut, Ohio. Dave, you've been here. Yeah, I know you have. We went together. Yeah. But uh, she was from there, and she uh, was over in Germany when the war broke out because of her uh, ability to speak so much good English. She was a, an aspiring actor who <laughs> flopped. So she was uh, the, the Tokyo Rose equivalent for uh, Germany. Spent time in prison last year. I visited her residence twice. It's in the cemetery south of Columbus, Mildred Gillers. Um, I'll keep going until they get the hook on my neck. The reason I have this, I've read a lot. Our guys would always write home to their parents, mom, dad, can you send fruitcake, candy, sweets? They were young teenagers, they wanted sweets from back home. The Germans, they would ask their parents, they'd write home, they wanted some methamphetamines. The reason the Blitzkrieg worked so well for the Germans is because they were all hopped up on, on uh, meth. And so they would ask mom and dad for some more. Bears there because they were the manufacturer of the methamphetamines. That's just a Rosie the Riveter. It's a man, local man. A lacious story of Battle of the Bulge. Afterwards, he was on a 40 and 8 that's a train car, and um, they found some wine in there. I have 18 different stories of liquor in this book, and that's one of us. It's good. But uh, he was up there, and one of his prisoners was a German, Werner Berlin, who happened to be Adolf Hitler's uh, painter. He painted portraits of Adolf Hitler, so he got him to paint a picture of himself. Oh, there's George Berghoff, who uh, I talked about a little bit ago. Uh, this is Dominique Gentile. Um, he was the, uh, the ace. He was being pinned by uh, General Eisenhower. Um, he was the, the ace initially, and Richard Long took his place. I'm going to get this one in. Hugh Schaefer, local guy. He got lost from his troops after we were in France, and he hid out at a... Uh, in a barn. The French farmer allowed him to hit there. When, he, when his troops came by, he joined up with them, and they gave the farmer gave him this violin, and he had it, if you could make it out, under a glass, a glass plaque back, not a plaque, a glass cover, and he was real proud of it. There's a story that, that goes when the heart, our men were going through Germany later on, they would call into the uh, <clears throat> a room, a building, and say, come out, we won't shoot. Come out, we won't shoot. Well, they said it in German, and they transposed the last word, shoot. They transposed some letters. And they all came out, but they were laughing. Come out, we won't shoot. <laughs> we won't shoot. Okay. And they did come out. Uh, 
I used Schaefer. I met him in 08. Oh, this this represents, and if I have to stop now, I'll gladly take questions, but who knows uh, what the longest battle in the history of the Army was, history of our, of the United States? I never knew, but I'm going to tell you, it's Battle of Hurtkin Forest from the beginning of the America's time to the end. Hurtkin Forest, that was right prior to the Battle of the Bulge. It went on a long, long time. And this, this just represents him. I have a story in there of that. And this is uh, Richard Gard. He turned 100 this past April, and he saved a lot of men at Battle of the Bulge. Uh, it's a citation. This is Bazooka, Bill Bazooka Cooper. All right. Is that official, Kelly? Dr. Chris. Oh, Chris. <laughs> um, go for go for one more finish story. story. Finish your story. Oh, okay. yeah. What's, what's in yeah. Bill Cooper. I was at his house. He was a mayor at one time of uh, Union, Ohio. I was at his house. Had a good conversation. I got ready to leave, and he had a commendation on the wall. Towards him, it said, "Bill Bazooka Cooper." I went right back in the house and I said, Mr. Cooper, I can't leave until I figure out what, how you got that nickname. He proceeded to tell me. He was in Battle of the Bulls. His superior said, take out this tank that's coming down. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so he was down in position with his bazooka, but the man who had the ammunition for the bazooka didn't have any left. So he's sitting in position, the Panzer tank's coming at him. And he says, I'll just have a Mexican standoff. If that uh, turret comes down, down my belly, I'm jumping in the, to the uh, ditch next to it. Well, the panzer's coming. He stops and he starts lurching back and he took off. So he was always known as Bill Bazooka Cooper. He took out a panzer. <laughs> All right, many more stories. I didn't even get to the Pacific. There's some great stories there. But, you know, thank you for coming and hope you enjoyed. I well, really appreciate you coming and sharing these wonderful stories with us. Are there any questions or stories you want to share with you? And yeah, question. Sir, you talked about we had uh, POW camps yes. in America. Weren't we worried about them escaping and going into America or well, doing espionage crap? Or... <laughs> Most of these, the ones up in St. Mary's were like 17 year old kids. A lot of times they put, I say kids, they're still soldiers that came really from Operation Torch. They came there, they put them there because there's so many Germans up there and uh, they would go to Christmas Mass up there and they say they're singing Silent Night, Holy Night. They join in, but with their German and it kind of melded really well. Uh, reading some old newspapers about that, they they said we were treated superbly the soldiers were we i couldn't believe it. we had every day meat in tin cans they had fruit they had vegetables they treated us a lot better because i found a fellow up there name escapes me he was a pow in germany and they had hay soup for that was their dinner so they were treated pretty well they would take these soldiers all our men were gone <clears throat> In, in the war, so they would take these soldiers and they put them at different farms because we need the labor. So they uh, travel all through that area. So many Americans could speak German. And so it got, they got along well. I ran to a woman over in, on Woodman Avenue who uh, married one of those soldiers and they started a life here and children, etc. So I don't think they're worried too much. They always had guards there with guns, but uh, the soldiers at St. Mary's lived in tents uh, where you saw that quasi hut, that was for the guards. So I don't think there was too much worried about it. They were enjoying their time here and being a POW. And under over at uh, Wright Patterson, they had 800 there. And um, I don't think there was a problem there either. Not that, not that I could find. Any other questions? Am I remembering correctly? Was Geller's Axis Sally? I think that's true. Geller's that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. I think she was Geller's. Yes, her, her, yeah, she was Axis Sally. Right? Yes, she, she was. For... And, 
what she would do, she'd get on the, the radio and she would tell the our soldiers how wicked it is. Um, you know, Adolf has a new plan that's just going to destroy you. Plus, she, they could get it over here and um, they would uh, they tell the soldiers, oh, your, your uh, women back home, your girlfriends, your wives, they are uh, with all the 4F guys. They have romantic interests. It just make them try to make them miserable. But yes, Axis Sally was the name given to her, like Tokyo Rose. Yes, but Mildred Gillers was her real name. Do you have video recordings of these? Do I have recordings of these? Of no, the interviews you've taken? Do you not have... recordings, no. I did. I went there at, for another reason, and you know, the video magnifiers, but um, afterwards I would ask them, um, what'd you do in the war? And many of them would tell me, others would not. I had this one gentleman, he started crying as soon as I knocked on the door, because today's date was an anniversary. Eventually, he talked. I don't cry. Once they say no, that's it. I'm not going to cry. But eventually, he told me he graduated in 44 from Salina High School. He was a merchant marine. <clears throat> in 45, he told the date that I was there. It didn't hit me till afterwards. Said the war was over. <clears throat> in 45, it was around two in the morning. He was up at the Arctic Circle, um, and he got hit by a torpedo. It didn't register with, with me yet that, the, that everything's over with. And he says, in tears, I don't know if I threw Gimpy in head first or if I threw him in feet first. But now they were both in this water. It was 29 degrees. And it's just, that's what it was at um, the Titanic, the same terrible temperature. And I said, my gosh, uh, Mr. Hone, here you are today. How did you possibly live? Because everyone else was gone from that ship. They were taking supplies over to Russia. And he says, well, there was a fishing ship over a distance away. They saw what was going on. And two old women saved us. I'm thinking 85, 90, 95. Two old women. So eventually I asked, well, how old were these women, Mr. Owen? Oh, about 30 years old. <laughs> but 17, 30, okay. I got it. But, uh, yeah, there's different men, I mean, men uh, cry, and I'm not trying to sound cocky or whatever, but they might tell me things they'd never tell their family because there's some things pretty horrid, and they don't want to. I can keep up with them on places and things. Man told me he was at Corregidor to explain what he did, but I I knew exactly what Corregidor was. I met another man. I was in the beer business in the early '80s, and every set every Wednesday morning, I would deliver beer to uh, right across from the VA. It's a bar, bar called Kenders. I'd arrive there at 7:30 in the morning, and there was a good 20, 25 men in there every week, all from across the street. That was their reprieve. They got out that time, and they would go there, and I would deliver the 15 to 20 cases, 40-ounce bottles every week. But there was one man, he never talked. I, because after I got paid, I would go through, and how are you doing? Good morning. How are you? To the man, but he never said, said a thing. He always sat way in the back, and he had a visor, yellow visor on. He had all these color pencil pencils right here. He had an art book, and he would just be doodling away. Once the Paul, who was the uh, manager, the owner, the, he told me he was a um, the Tom Death March survivor. So, uh, and, uh, and it occurred to me, that's why he didn't talk. But I'd go there three veterans days in a row uh, and I'd go to there and I'd buy a round of beer for the guys. And he was the most talkative, thankful person you ever saw. It was just a beer. But he was so appreciative of that act, and that made me really kick it into gear. What was going through that man's mind? Where the moment he massacred, I mean, not the moment he massacred, the Baton Death March was just horrible what they did to the Americans and especially the Filipinos. I did meet a man at the moment he massacred, which is, if you're familiar with that one, who 
It was December 17th. Now, December 16th was yesterday when the ghost front attack, 250,000 Germans attacked us, didn't know it was coming. So they were they were not really soldiers, never even trained to be soldiers, These this group of men. And they were just getting information, please, information to find out where the enemy was. But uh, Joaquin Piper, who was uh, Adolf Hitler's fair-haired child, is, he loved this guy. He came by, he was an SS officer, and, and after stealing their wallets, watches, money, and whatever they could, he had them raise their hands, and burp guns just took them all down. They thought all of them down, but after a while, someone yelled, thinking he was the only one alive, but if anyone's still with us, let's make a run for it. So from different things I read, 15 of them were still alive, and they made it out, and one of them was this man who lived up in St. Henry, Ohio, Harold Kleinhans was his name. Is that a long answer to that question? I forgot the question. <laughs> Anything else? Oh, yes, ma'am. Uh, my name is Cheryl Lloyd, and I'm a husband Andy. We're both from the UK, and uh, we really feel the, the, the gratitude to the, the stories that you've given of the people that have given what they have done for us, actually, as well for the world, but for, for us too. We, we very much feel it. So, thank you for bringing this to the to life. Thank you. That's sweet. Um, but also, I just wondered, are you planning on having another book? Are you still collecting well, information? The one, the one I wrote was people I met. I, there's no none of those men alive, really, anymore. And maybe a few, but I don't have the opportunity to meet them like I used to. If I do a book, I would love to tell stories of men that were there, but I've never got to meet. Um, I'll do a quick one. You can bear with me. It's a guy from Kaiser High School. His name was um, Larry Tipton. He never finished his senior year in high school. December 7th, Pearl Harbor. Two weeks later, Christmas vacation. He never came back. Where he want, went to, they, they, they meet, made people, let's go, let's go, let's go. He was in the Philippines when it was taken over in May of 45. He was captured uh, by the Japanese, 63,000 were. He was put on a boat to Japan. 70 months he was in a POW camp. Friends died, he was tortured, he weighed next to nothing. In May of that year, we started knocking off those islands over there and, um, and he was put on a cargo ship. They were gonna move him and 900 other American POWs to another place. POW camp. Well, against the Geneva Convention, they did not market an American submarine torpedo. Them. Out of the 900, 800 died. Larry made it out along with a hundred other ones. There was a some sort of brass, a lieutenant, whatever, who jumped in a small boat, a Japanese man, and he started with a machete, hitting whoever they could that were still in the water. The American sailors. And uh, he found another guy, he happened to be from Oregon, is on a wooden doorway that was in the water. They both were able to share that. Eventually they made it. They saw land. They waited till uh, daytime. They came up. Some Filipinos helped them. They made their way back to the States. Now that, now he's gone now, but I have stories like that that are really captivating. But since you're from England, I have to tell one story, and I'm going to put it right on you. <laughs> well, you might have heard that. Americans, there's a little complaint that the English guys would say, you're overpaid, you're oversexed, and you're over here. <laughs> And I followed this all through Europe that they continually go up to the GIs. You got any gum chum? And there's a big hit rate of hit song back at back then. You got any gum chum? And to music, one of the big band, band big band bands did it. But it wasn't, it was English, but it wasn't just English people, it was in all the countries there speaking French, speaking Spanish, speaking whatever, they they caught on to that. You got any gum chum and they get some candy from the GIs. 
But let's hand it to our side. They got a good way to get back, a good rebuttal. You got a sister, mister? <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for the kind words. Uh, uh, my father was there and most everyone here. And Dick, Dick's father was there, all of you know people. Growing up, I had a paper route up and down and I knew I could go back to Bayside Drive right now and tell you who was in the service. So that's the era I grew up in. Yeah. Any other questions? Again, thank you so much thank for coming. You.